Welcome to the Invested Teacher Podcast with Kyle Pierce, Matt Bigley, and John Orr. Get ready to be taught as we share our successes and failures encountered during our real-life lessons learning how to build generational wealth from the ground up. Welcome, Invested students, to another episode of the Invested Teacher Podcast. All right, my friends, we are excited to dig into yet another episode As we mentioned each and every week, uh, we look forward to this opportunity to chat all things investing. And in today's episode, we actually want to start tackling some of the hurdles that we might be experiencing, not just investing in general, but in particular with real estate investing, something that we've been getting a lot of feedback from you, the invested students, are how do how do we actually get started mm-hmm. like people mm-hmm. are intrigued out there uh we've we've had a few people reaching out with like specific questions about what to do next and we really just want to unpack some of the common hurdles that you might experience when you are considering investing in real estate because let's be honest the ones that are on your mind right now are probably not all of the hurdles that you may encounter. So why not just dig into them here today? Matt, get us started here. Uh, Let's start with, and and again, there's no order here, but probably something some educators or invested students out there, if you're not an educator listening in, might experience when they are starting to try to dip their toes into the investment in real estate game. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, you know, I think about us as as learners, teachers especially, but I think, you know, anyone in a professional capacity who has been to and enjoyed school and maybe gone gone on to post-secondary, like we're such learners, so many of us, that also means that we can get into a real analysis paralysis with this. It's like we want to learn, read about, listen to podcasts and audiobooks, you know, before we ever really do it. So a lot of people you'll find in, in this space are just how stuck on the learning part. Mm. And I was certainly this way as well. Like, so mm-hmm. here's what's great about the real estate investing community. There is so much shared knowledge out there. I remember listening to every episode of multiple real estate investing podcasts, went to some training, bought some books. But just like with our students, we know that the best way is to learn by doing and mm-hmm. to learn with some support. And so to have a partner or a JV uh, can just really help flatten that learning curve, remove some of the scary fears that people might have that oftentimes are easily solvable or even irrational and move forward in their real estate investing journey. So to Mm -hmm. me, I always think that the hardest part is finding the right properties. I think that's the biggest hurdle in real estate investing. And now that's my perspective as a mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know veteran experienced real estate investor, but finding the right properties, you know, uh, is is fundamental to all of this. If you choose the wrong one, mm-hmm. it's it's going to you're going to smack into that proverbial brick wall really fast. Mm-hmm. You're going to maybe get yourself into too big of a project. You're going to select perhaps a property that isn't in you know, an area of uh, that's that's highly rentable or that isn't attractive to a great tenant profile. So I think the biggest hurdle is s- selecting the right property. And thankfully, mm-hmm. we have a really good process that we've we've created and learned to find the right properties. And it actually doesn't even require you to go out and visit the properties. You can actually do a lot of this right from your computer, right from your desk. That's one mm-hmm. of the neat things about investment properties, maybe as opposed to your own personal residence where there's so much you know, emotion and there's so many more maybe fundamentals and intangibles that you're looking for there. Yep. You can really scout a lot of properties. The volume of scouting you can do before ever setting foot in a property is, is pretty fantastic. Yeah. And I think, you know, selecting a property is a, a, a big barrier. And I, and I, and I, I, I think I, I agree with you in some extent, Matt, there that it is the biggest, but I think the one that you said initially is one of the bigger ones. And I think that's what held me back uh, for a number of years before I took that plunge. And it was because if we're a beginning and, you know, investor, we've never done this before that, that fear of, you know, picking the wrong property, even if you've done all of the tips that we're going to give you today on choosing the property. um, I think there's still that fear, like, how do I know I'm doing this the right way? And I think, Mm. think that's, that's the scary part for a lot of people to step, step their, you know, dip their toes in the water is, is because we don't know, like if I've never done this before, 
how do I know I'm going to do it right? And in the best way, like what you said, Matt, is is to partner. Like what? How do I find that partner? Like finding someone to do this with, especially if they've done it before, will actually take all of that fear away because that's that's what I did. I partnered with the two of you to buy a property, but I had done all the reading. I had done all the analyzing in prior years, but I never had the guts mm. to go alone. I had to have and for my own, you know, for my own peace of mind, for my own safety, for my family safety, it had to be with someone who knew what to do when. So it's like you can you can count on them to handle handle things. And then through that learning process, that helps kind of get your feet wet to say so that you have more confidence to go, you know what, the next one, maybe I don't need to have the partners. Maybe I can try the smaller one on my own, or maybe I have a next one on my own. Like Matt, what do you, when we say partnering, what, what, like, what does a JV mean? We, we, I think we've thrown that term out here on the podcast a number of times. Um, but, uh, we, we became joint venture, you know, partners. What would you say to, to define that here for everybody moving forward? We are going to talk about uh, lots of other hurdles, but, uh, this, this, this one being the first one. So John, I think when, uh, you know, when looking for a partner in real estate, and I should say from the outset that I started my real estate investing journey with, with partners and I'm a mm -hmm. huge proponent, a huge believer in partners. You know, it's, you know, they say you'd rather have uh, 50% of something than a hundred percent of nothing, you know? And so mm -hmm. to me, when right. looking for partners, as I started this journey, of course, I was looking for people who had different attributes to me, people who brought, mm -hmm. brought different things to the table. So, you know, finding Kyle as my partner, he's a real numbers guy, incredibly analytical, can just comprehend and, and and run numbers like no one I've ever met. He's like a human computer and uh, <laughs> also a real passion for, you know, passion for real estate. We had another partner at the time who had a construction background and that was actually oh, one right, of the, yeah. that when we started, that was my biggest hurdle. I thought that, oh, was, that was a, con that was definitely a confidence booster, right? Like yes, for us to go yes. into some of those earlier deals. 100%. I'm better with a phone than a hammer. That is so true. Anybody who knows me knows that. So I'm not a, I'm not someone who's going to be able to fix a plumbing issue or even necessarily analyze. I, at the time, I would have been, wouldn't have been able to analyze a property from that from that uh, mm. in, instruction or construction integrity standpoint. So, so that was important. So I don't know, maybe this could go to either of you, maybe Kyle. Um, coming from that point of view, like I, let's say I'm a person who's looking to get into this and I'm looking for a partner. You, you know, you mentioned having a number analyzer. Uh, you also mentioned having, you know, you felt like that person who knew about construction housing could look at, you know, almost be like the inspector walking mm -hmm. through with you to go, you know what, we're going to need to fix this. This is not a great property because this is going to happen. Like, like, would you guys say that you need that partner, you know, that construction partner, that finance partner, like that, that, that analyzer partner, like, is that, is that a necessary formula? They Do all, you that's think move for moving forward? Such a great question. And I would say, no. And the reason I say mm. no is because everyone is so different. Like, you know, prior to having that partnership form, and this was a formal partnership, meaning like, you know, we had we had sort of long term goals to together continue to scale up using our own money, but like kind of pooling our our mental abilities and, and strengths and skills. Um, but I would argue that, you know, 10 years prior, I was starting my journey by doing all of the work. And I was, I, I'm a stubborn person. You guys know this. It's like when I commit to something, I sort of, you know, I go through with it. And at the time when I first got into this, into this world, I did all the reading. I did all the research. I did all the searching of the properties. I mm -hmm. was saving my own money. So not yeah. using other people's money. I did all of those things on my own. But it took me probably 10 times longer, right? So it's like, right. can it be done? Absolutely, it can be done without partners. But now knowing what I know, I feel like I would be way ahead of the game had I not, like, had I, like, sort of thought of doing something with others. And, and to be honest, early on, what I should have done was I probably should have came in simply with the money, continue to do my learning. So I'm not suggesting people don't continue to do the learning, but going in with someone who has experience or a group that have experience and continuing to learn alongside them so that when I'm doing that reading, when I'm reading this book, when I'm analyzing properties independently on my own, 
I could reach out to those to those co-ventures if it's a, a joint venture, or I could reach out to that partner if it's a formal partnership. Um, I could go and I could learn and I could essentially be mentored by them and expedite the process. So, you know, Matt, you just nailed it. It's like typically if you go into like, say, a joint venture agreement with a party, uh, what you typically are doing usually is usually there's like a money side, the person who brings the money and the mortgage. And then the other side is all the rest. So, you know, finding the property, mm -hmm. vetting the property, ensuring the roof's not going to cave in tomorrow. Like all of those things are happening. And typically you split the profits 50-50 after the money partner is paid out. So that's that's the key there. It's not like you're going to give half of your down payment to the other party. You're just bringing it and it's like it's going to help make this deal go forward. Mm -hmm. And then at mm -hmm. some point down the road, oftentimes it's five years, but really it can be any over any length of time. You're either going to plan to refinance it to pull equity out and then pay the money partner back or you're going to maybe even sell and and sell and then pay the money partner back and then split the profits. So mm. that's like a typical um, joint venture that you may have heard of. And ultimately, what I want to do is I want to make sure that, you know, I am not, I guess, I don't want to say wasting time because the learning process is so worth it, but I want to make sure, um, I, I want to make sure that we, we actually move forward at a faster pace right. so that I can slow down the time of learning. So when I bought that first property in 2011, I had started reading about real estate and learning and, and, and investing in general, probably back in, I mean, really all the way through, I was learning about investing, but specifically about real estate, it's probably a good five years Whoa. of learning about it. And then within the the two years prior to buying, it was like an every night thing, like literally vetting properties, but I had no one to talk to. I had no one to ask questions to. It was all me. And it was like, over time, I almost had to like force myself past what, that finish line to go, right. I'm buying and, this property. And what was it, Kyle, that pushed you over that finish line? Honestly, I, I think it was, I, th I think it was almost like a sunk cost thing. You know, we we've read some books about sunk cost fallacy, right. this idea yeah. that as soon as you invest some time or effort or money, you gotta into get, something that's the throwing you, bad money after bad money. Yeah. You got to keep going. Right. <laughs> but I had invested so much time and energy. And like I said, I'm a stubborn guy, right? Like, so that's a, a thing about me that it's sort of like, I'm like, I set out to do this thing. So I'm going to do it. I, I flew out to Florida multiple times. I flew out to different parts of Florida. And when I found, and here's the interesting part, it was like, it took me like probably, like I said, five years or so through this process to finally find uh, what I'm going to call is like an informal partner through my realtor, the realtor, Brett Kroom from, from um, in uh, down in Fort uh, Myers in Florida. So anyone listening from Fort Myers, Florida, Brett's your guy. <laughs> Brett took care of me. And honestly, he had owned investment properties. So he Got essentially it. acted like that mentor for me. So it worked out great. And I know, Matt, you do that for so many of your clients that are looking to get into real estate, do it in sort of an informal way. Um, but ultimately, had I been smarter, I would have found someone already doing the work and I would have said, listen, I've got this much money I want to get in so that I can, one, get into a good asset and property, benefit from it, maybe not benefit 100% of the upside, right? We're going to split that upside 50-50, but the benefit is I'm going to do it so much faster and I know I feel confident so that maybe the next time around I choose to do it on my own or maybe I learn that actually this isn't for me to do all the work. I just want to be that silent money partner over here, right? So for us, we enjoy doing that work, but for many others, they're going, you know what? It's great. I want to learn about investing in real estate, but I actually don't have the time, don't want to commit the time, or I just, I don't enjoy the work that's necessary in order to find good properties and do this work all by myself. 
Yeah. And I think Kyle, what, what's interesting about what you just said is it really is a chance for you to dip your toe into real estate investing without having to, you know, dive right in. And, and the, you're, you know, you as you experience it and as you learn it, it's really scaffolded so that you can, you, maybe you start with a joint venture and you, you know, you are the money partner, but you start to learn the operational side, the active part of, you know, owning and managing uh, properties. And you say, you know what, I, that, that's, that's awesome. That's great. Or yeah, maybe you just continue to sit back and be a passive partner and uh, and build your portfolio that way and i think it's important to differentiate between you know joint ventures versus just friends like a lot of people and mm. Kyle we were you know friends and colleagues before we started uh John and Kyle you guys were friends and John we've become friends so there's some community to be built from this and there's some fr- there's obviously friendship to be found in these common interests you know some people go play golf on Sunday mornings like we analyze properties and talk about real estate you know <laughs> everybody's got not always options. on a Sunday morning but not always sometimes. on a Sunday morning but you know it's the equivalent but i want to really make clear to people that this is uh, this is business, you know? And so all of this is uh, very transparent. It's all documented. We actually just went through a, a, a major JV purchase together yeah. and, you know, it was uh, hours and hours of, um, you know, uh, honing our uh, joint venture agreement, working with our legal team. So it's important to have, you know, a great power team behind you by that. I mean, you know, uh, lawyers, accountants, eventually property managers, um, handymen, all those types of things that come with owning real estate. And so we worked through that process and we had some really great back and forth with our joint venture partner to ensure that all of his questions were answered and that he had Mm. peace of mind making a major investment with us. Um, and, you know, albeit he's going to be on the passive side. So we're the ones who right. found that property. We're the ones who vetted the property, did the inspection, did did the, you know, negotiating. And, and ultimately, you know, he came in after the fact. So we had done all that upfront work and overcome all those hurdles. And this particular property was months and months and months. And so he was able to come in and take have the opportunity to come into a deal that we had already vetted, negotiated, selected, and to, you know, ultimately become the money partner on that side. But it's it's all legally documented, it's all transparent. And just like any good business, you know, you almost need to you have, you have to plan with the end in mind, we say in teaching, or we have to plan with the divorce in mind. Like what what are all the eventualities and, and how could those be addressed? If someone at the end of that five-year term wants to sell, wants to refinance, you know, wants out, whatever it might be, all those things are addressed up front in any partnership I've been in where that has been the case, it is always allowed for a much smoother and a more problem-free partnership for sure. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. You know what? I think, Matt, you just outlined another hurdle that I heard right there. And I think uh, uh, especially for, for newbies is, is thinking about time. Do I have the time to do this? Like I, I want, I want to change my, you know, the trajectory of my wealth uh, in the future. I, I want to have, you know, passive income. I want to have this this lifestyle that allows me to retire early. And we know that, you know, from all our previous episodes, investing in real estate can be a pathway to get there. Um, But the question is, do I, you know, a hurdle is I I work a full-time job. I, you know, I have a family. um, I've got a, you know, if I have younger kids, I'm hurtling them around to every, you know, their sporting events or their, you know, club events. And, and it's like, when do I have the time to kind of analyze or or look at or learn about the investing and then go through like what you said, you you, you know, you had mentioned that you, you had spent hours and hours working on this deal. Kyle said he spent so, so many, t- you know, every night analyzing properties to learn like I heard time is a barrier for sure. And I think I think that is true in any in anything that we're going to kind of go through. But I think, I think you've also answered that hurdle, um, Matt and, and Kyle has as well, when talking about the joint venture opportunity is that you can actually take that time off your plate and work with partners who are experienced that way. And then they get to invest that time and use their expertise to shorten that up. And then you get to kind of benefit in that, in that partnership. So even though time's a a hurdle, I think we've kind of answered that it it doesn't have to be. And and before you go on there, John, uh, because I think you want to get us into this next piece. I just want to mention too, it's like even time, it's like, it's one of those things that it can't, like you might have some time, but the thing is, it's like, you don't get to just go like, Hey, every couple of weeks I'll dedicate some time. Right. Cause that's not how it works. It's like when a good deal or, or when I say right. a good deal, like something that isn't just 
the average of what's out there because you can go pick pretty much any property out there, right? And buy it for a, a pretty decent price and you'll probably be okay in the long run. But I'm guessing most people who are listening are like, I don't want to just buy like whatever's out there. I want yeah. like there to be some advantage, like almost like that, that safety, right? You want to have that margin of safety there. Like when we're buying a property, we sort of, we always know that, you know, Murphy's law will take over. Like something isn't going to go exactly as it seems. So having a margin of safety is really key. So I might have a couple hours a month to commit to this, but if I only do it once a month and I spend three hours, uh, a deal may have come and gone, right? Or you know, the, right. the deal that is coming tomorrow, you're not going to see because you're not going to be on the computer looking at it in the next month. So I think that's another piece that we have to also think about. It's not just time, but it's also like a consistent amount of time, consistent a uh, habit of sort of just doing this thing that each and every day, or whether it might not be every single day, but with it, you know, every couple of days, I mean, for us, it's pretty much every day we're watching what's happening and we're digging in and we're always analyzing something. There's always something on the plate for us to consider. And we just have to figure out whether it's worth eating or not, right. Whether it's worth actually gobbling up or whether it just passes by. And let's be honest, like Matt, I don't know how, throw a percentage on it. Like how many, how many of the deals we analyze are just going right into the garbage, right? I mean, it's yeah, gotta be like 95 percent, like a the At overwhelming least. vast majority of them. We never even set foot in, which makes it easy, like convenient from that standpoint, but, but it definitely... also makes it easy to give up, right? Like it does you make, might yes, analyze a hundred yes. deals and you're like, Oh my God, is this ever going to pay off? Right. And it's like, if you don't have that, that habit, the commitment, the dedication, sort of like that stick to itiveness that you're like, we're going, if this is going to pay off, right? Like a lot of people, it's like right away, they're like, ah, you know, I spent my hour looking and I, I, I don't, I don't see anything. So like, I'm just going to move on to the next thing. Right. Um, if that's you and you're listening to this, that's totally fine. Like that might just be who you are. And maybe it doesn't mean that you can't be a real estate investor, I think is the, is the key messaging that we've, we've been trying to highlight here. For sure. For sure. You know, and, and Matt brought up another, another, uh, hurdle, um, you know, early in, in the, ep in the episode about hunting for deals. You guys have mentioned that a few times just now as well about, hunting for that deal and what does that look like because i think that can be a hurdle for many people but before we get into that hurdle and i think what we're going to do uh was we're going to save that hurdle for the next episode um you know we 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 can go forever on all these hurdles and trying to answer them for you and i think we should dedicate time for that so i wanted to, to discuss a, a hurdle that i have always thought about before we get into the hunting because a hurdle that has to, i think has to come first come before uh, you know, hunting for a deal and deciding, can I hunt for that deal is thinking about like, can I afford, you know, can I afford to invest? Can I, can I afford to buy this property? And I know that we've talked in previous episodes about creating that, that cushion, creating the down payment, you know, finding way, you know, finding different ways to start your investment fund. If you have not yet listened to some of those episodes, especially our blueprint series, Go back and listen to those three episodes on the blueprint to your financial wealth building journey. Um, but the I think what I'm getting at is let's say I have my fund, I've got my down payment fund ready to go. The, you know, to go and, and purchase a property, uh, you know, that we're not going to be able to purchase it full cash. And, and if if you can, that 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 I think might relieve yeah. this hurdle. But but I mean, if if we're gonna go and buy this, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollar home. I have maybe the down payment ready to go because of how I followed the blueprint uh, the series, and, or maybe I have this this cash on on the side, or I'm ready to go. Um, but I, I'm going to have to get a loan, right? I, and I I've always wondered about going to a lender and going like, okay, I'm at a lender. Um, will I get approved? Should I go and get pre-approval? Like this is a hurdle, I think, for many people. Like this is a stumbling block that might go, I'm not gonna go because uh, do I have to go to the bank and ask for permission? Do I have when I when I do select the deal, do I want to be in a position where I put an offer down and it's conditional on financing? Or do I put an offer down that's like, let's waive that because I've already pre-approved? How do I know, mm -hmm. especially? If I've already got a property 
on this, you know, already going. So let's say I've already, I've already got a property. It's a rental property. I was already approved for that because it was like my second mortgage. I've got a house, you know, I got my mortgage on my house. I got approval to have another mortgage on another house. Will I get another one? Like there's this mm. hurdle of like, how many houses can I ask the bank to, you know, to give me money for? Um, I think that's a hurdle right now. Well, guys, what is, what is your experience on that? I know, I know that I've been approved with you guys as that joint adventure, but I'm curious about the next one. Will we get approval to have a, a mortgage for as many properties as we want? Yeah, I, I love that, John. And it's funny because I remember back when we engaged in that first joint venture, uh, I, you know, you and I having worked so closely together and knowing each other so well, like I knew all <laughs> essentially all of your finances, right? So yeah, this yeah. wasn't even really something we we talked about explicitly simply because I knew the answers to these questions, but you never really did, right? You were just no. like, oh, okay, it's gonna, it's gonna work out. And right. I mean, I'm sure myself having my mortgage license and, you know, having that experience is, is obviously helpful. Um, but when I, when I look at that and I think back, I go, well, wait a second. Like a lot of people who are listening are probably wondering like, how much of a down payment do I even need? Like if you're listening to this and maybe you're early in your career, maybe you're, you know, just starting out in a profession, be it education or be it in the health sector or some other sector where, you know, again, you're like a salaried employee and you're going, I want to, I want to get into investing in real estate. Can I like how much do I have to put down? And, you know, one benefit, if you've never purchased a home before, like if you, if you're like first time home buyer, you could actually put down like 5%. I would, I would definitely recommend for anyone in that situation, mm. reach out to us and we'll do our best to help you get going because I would recommend like a house hack, which would be either, you know, buying a house and renting out some rooms. So someone else is paying for part of your mortgage or, uh, you might buy a duplex, for example, and again, you could put down that 5% and it is definitely worth it if it means getting you into the market. Now, if you're like Matt, John and I, we own our primary residence, which is fantastic. We all have mortgages on our primary res residence. Um, so that means that when we go and purchase another property and it's not a second home like so it's not a vacation property it's not you know a second home it's actually an investment property there's some things that we have to consider and one of them that I'll mention right now is first off typically you're looking at 20% down for your down payment now why is it different than say the 5% well the the not the investors but the lenders know that if this is an investment property you have less i guess incentive to follow through with your obligation because it's not where you're living it's not your primary residence right, right? right probably have less emotional attachment matt and i talk about this all the time it's like there's no emotions in what we do in investing in real estate so lenders know that and they say we want more skin in the game we want more of a sunk cost from you, the investor, to make sure that you're serious about this thing, right? So you got to get that 20% going, but then you're going, where's the other 80% coming from? And that's typically going to come from a lender. Now, typically you're looking at what we call like a primary lender, like a big bank, you know, they're going to offer the lowest interest rates. The interest rates are still going to be a little higher on an investment property than they would be on your primary residence. So keep that in mind. That should hmm. not be a shocker to you when you go into the bank and they go, wait a second, you know, you're offering this person over here, this rate, and you're making me pay this rate. Well, guess what? It's because it's a riskier proposition for the bank. They still know it's against real estate, which they're all happy to do, but they want to make sure that you're serious about the thing that you're about to do. Right. So higher interest rate, but then it comes down to, can you afford it? And that piece is really important because what you may or may not know is that many lenders actually don't take all of the rental income and add it to your personal income when they're actually running, whether you can afford it or not. A lot of them will only take 50%. So again, they're trying to add a margin of safety for themselves to make sure, hey, John, are you earning enough money? Like, should you be doing this? Like, is this mm -hmm. good? Like what happens if a tenant, you know, vacates the property and you don't get rent for two months in a row? Are you going to be able to do this? So they don't want 
your income to look inflated with the rents. So they kind of minimize that. This is if you're buying personally in your own personal name. Right. And once you've done that, then they're going to run through essentially all of your expenses. And I think in a future episode, we can maybe dig into each of those items that will actually be analyzed by them. But essentially, it's your uh, it's your debt to income ratio that they look at. And they right. want to make sure they'd like it to be under 36% typically, but sometimes you can push it all the way up to like 42, 43%, which I would not recommend. Like if you're going to push it to that level, like it's- and There's reasons. Oh, There's reasons yeah, that you're they You're just getting into it. this thing and you're not exactly sure. Like, you know, if that's the limit that they're willing to do, it's like, hmm, maybe I want to rethink this a little bit. And I want to, you know, again, reach out to someone who might be able to guide you through that process. Maybe it's chatting with a joint venture or who wants to do some sort of deal with you so that if there's trouble, maybe the joint venture agreement has something in it that ensures that you're not going to lose your shirt. So that's another piece there. Why, you know, the, the partnering idea or joint venture idea can be really, really helpful. And Kyle, I think one tip for people is to not just stroll into their current financial institution and expect them to give them the best deal, the best terms. There's I've got so many examples of clients of mine, uh, whether investors or buying for themselves, you know, they've dealt with a bank for 20, 30, like 40, their whole lifetime, and they go to get a mortgage. And they're oftentimes shocked that there's no, um, no value placed on their loyalty and on the tenure of that time with the <laughs> bank. And, you know, so that's certainly something to think about shopping around, getting a second or a third opinion. And I think what I've learned as a realtor um, and an investor is that every bank almost has like a, um, a different way of treating the same scenario, you know, and, and, mm. and I've been impressed and surprised by, I had an experience recently with one of the, you know, one of the big banks where um, they pulled some miracles together. Maybe that was just a, an individual with, you know, in this case, it was TD that I said, wow, that was amazing. After we had, you know, gone some of the other routes that, that I would have normally gone down with, with clients and this uh, TD lender pulled together some miracles. RBC, I had a, a great deal with them recently where they, you know, considered some overseas income, whereas, uh, you know, uh, another lending channel we had tried to go through wouldn't consider it. Oftentimes, I like personally dealing with credit unions because there's less staff turnover in those institutions, and you get to actually develop a relationship, uh, you know, with your lender on a little more a personal level. And I think context, even though this is all about the numbers, the context can really matter. Um, and and so I've had you know uh, lenders in credit unions uh, in in my own personal uh, financial history go to bat for us. Um, and say like, here's the context around why we should, you know, consider this deal. And then uh, mortgage brokers, and I'm talking all in generalities here, but brokers tend to be very creative and have lots of different lending channels, you know, and so right across the spectrum of rates and terms, you know, and, and these are the guys you, you can call when you need sort of maybe money fast, or maybe the, you know, the fundamentals aren't there for the lender. And, you know, you need to get uh, a, a you know a loan from a B lender, which is going to be a higher interest rate, maybe different terms, or all the way to private money. So I'm actually I'm never worried about finding the money personally because there are so many different channels out there. And I had a call last night from a big bank uh, rep who said we can lend up to 40 properties, which is huge, but we can't go over four units. I was telling him about the nine unit we just closed, and he said, "Oh, that would have been too big for us." So I think part of this is learning mm -hmm. that lender landscape and. And, and not just putting all of your lending uh, eggs in one basket, you know, and knowing what each of the lenders can maybe provide and, and, and shopping that a little bit, right. And, and uh, you know, finding out who is going to be able to work with you on a particular deal, given those circumstances. And again, maybe leveraging your JV partner, your realtor, asking them for advice about, uh, you know, getting a second or, or third opinion. I love it. I love it, Matt. And and you just referenced something like just this idea of every lender is a little different. This is where a mortgage agent or a mortgage broker can be really helpful, a helpful tool in your arsenal. Now, that doesn't mean that every deal will necessarily land with your mortgage agent or broker. What I would recommend people don't do is don't go to brokers and then sort of like make them do all this you know, work and then try to you know cut them out. You don't pay anything to a mortgage agent or a mortgage broker. They get paid by the lender, just like the person at the big bank gets paid to be there that day to set up the mortgage. So it really has nothing to do with you. But 
you should be going out talking to the banks you do have a relationship with, right? Because they might be, they might have a program, just like you said, Matt, like it might, might have a unique structure that could be really helpful. So definitely look at that. But ultimately, in the long run, it's really good to have someone in your corner, because you know what will happen ultimately is if you do more than a single deal, you are going to find hiccups along the way. And the one thing that you do want is you want to have someone that's going to be in your corner trying to ensure that you're protected, but that also the deal actually goes through. And that's one thing that I know from that industry that you do get is you get this like one-on-one -on -one customer service. They're like, listen, we're going to make sure this happens they often are talking directly to underwriters and saying, here's the situation. We've got to get this done. And I've seen some pretty magical things happen that way. Whereas at the big bank, you know, the call goes to the manager or the, you know, walk out to the manager in the branch and the branch has, has to call the next manager. And then that manager yeah. has to call Toronto. And, you know, so <laughs> that can be a, a bit of a concern if it is a more complex deal, which again, deals get complex as you get deeper into this situation. So once again, yeah. having a team of yeah. people, be it through partnerships or joint ventures, can often alleviate a lot of that learning and hassle and relationship building that you may not have the time or effort or energy to do. Yeah. And it's I relationships, think guys. It's relationships, right? And I think throughout this, it's been a theme relationships, relationships, relationships. You know, we've dealt with the same commercial lender for seven years now. It doesn't mean we're rubber stamped, but we can have mm -hmm. a little more candid conversation. It's relationships with our insurance providers who can, you know, call their underwriters. It's relationships with home inspectors. It's it's relationships among our investing community. That's that's really what you know my totally. big takeaway well is, which said. I should well, that's, that's, for the end of the episode. No, that, that I think we, we we are at the end of the end of this episode, Matt. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, but I think that's a great takeaway, right? Like I think what I heard you two just say about you know the lending hurdle is is that uh, one is that if you're looking to get into you know into buying a property into an investment, you might want to think about what is your debt to income ratio. Will you meet that that criteria? And then also what I just heard from you is, is to build a relationship with someone who can walk you through and help you along the way, like a mortgage uh, broker in that situation. We got a mortgage broker for our deal that we did together and they helped us kind of get that approved, go through those steps. So so I think that big idea, if we, if we summarize the hurdles we've talked about so far in this episode, one, we started with kind of that big hurdle at the beginning about going alone. Like, do I, can I do this? What is the, what is the the threshold that I need to step into so that I actually go from the analysis stage to actually implementing this, the, you know, these deals. And one, we said, like, Hey, try to, to do this with partners, especially early in your, in your journey. Kyle said he did that with his real, real, uh, real estate uh, broker. Um, you know, we, we did that together. Uh, Matt says he did that with partners to to uh, to do this. So make sure that we are finding a partner to not go alone. I think that's the the step that's going to get you past that initial hurdle. We talked about time as a hurdle and dedicating the right time uh, so that you can analyze deals, which we are going to talk about in a future episode of of, of that hurdle. How do I analyze deals? Because that's going to be a hurdle for sure to overcome. Uh, and then we talked about lending approval. Like that's going to be a hurdle for us. Can I get approved? Should I go and get a pre-approval? Who should I be talking to? Where's my best action? We talked about building that relationship. So we talked a, a few, th these few hurdles for sure we have to consider. Our action item, I think right now is, is thinking about should I, where can I find that partner? Um, mm. where, where can I build these relationships? Um, we, you know, we, we've got, we've got some, some options there for you. Um, but, uh, I think these are some hurdles and I think, I think walking away today, you've got some, a better sense of what hurdles you're going to accomplish, even though we are going to talk about some more in our next episode, but you've got, uh, you, you've got, um, uh, some, some, some next step actions to take away here. I love it. I love it. So John, you've kind of summarized and also mentioned a few takeaways yourself. I, you know, sort of the big takeaway for me in this episode and something that, again, I, I'm going to reiterate, I wish I knew a long time ago. Uh, I think I can summarize it as by, by partnering or by finding a joint venture that works well for you, that gives you what you need, that, that sort of fills in the gaps or, or some of the missing pieces for you. 
is definitely worth the while. And I guess I'll summarize it as saying, don't be greedy. And I, I think mm-hmm. I'm the type of person, like when I see that, I'm like, wait a second, like I'm not going to get all the benefit out of the deal, right? Because when it's a mm. joint venture, it's like you don't right, get you 100%. Split it. But it's because you've partnered together. And like, John, you and I, we run a math business together. It's like, that is a joint venture. Like, it's actually a partnership. Like, we mm-hmm. are in that together. And it's like, you could have done it on your own. And I could have done it on my own. But I'm guessing, I'm not guessing, I know for a fact that without each other, we would not have had the success we've had in that particular industry. Matt and I are in the same boat with real estate. I could have went alone on that six unit building that both you and I were watching, but were too scared to pull the trigger on because at the time we didn't have all the pieces fit. We didn't have that contractor, that, uh, you know, hammer throwing, um, sort of confidence that was holding us back. So we found that out there. So again, I I want you to just think about that when you are making that first step. Don't let greed step in the way from taking the next step for you. I'm not saying it means you do a JV. I'm not saying that you have to partner with someone, but if that is holding you back because you're worried about not getting the upside, you're just essentially wasting time and now you're getting zero. So, you know, like you said, Matt, it's like 50% is better than 0%. Um, So make sure that you're keeping yourself moving forward Uh, for those who are listening to this and going like, that's me, you know, like I'm, I'm Kyle 10 and 15 years ago, who was like, I want a hundred percent of it. And you're like, you want to actually take the next step. Uh, We've got a a quick little form. Uh, We have a JV list of people who have expressed to us in the past that, Hey, they're like, when a good deal comes and you guys are looking for partners or co-venturers um, that we reach out to them and we we essentially share the deal with them. And uh, we just closed on one Tuesday, Matt and I, which uh, is a, a fantastic deal. And everybody wins in that deal, which is great. Even the seller, which is really cool. We'll, we'll unpack that in a future episode. So that sounds like you, and that's going to help you take your next step. Head over to investedteacher.com forward slash JV, just the letters J. V. Uh, again, that's investedteacher.com forward slash JV. It's about take you one minute. There's no, it's not a hard commitment or anything. It's just to let us know that you're out there and that you're interested. And uh, I'm telling you, you're not going to get pelted with deals because guess what? Most of them were thrown away. We're just, you know, <laughs> taken right off our plate and we don't share those with anyone. So until we are ready to put the deal under contract, you don't hear about it. So uh, keep that in mind, investedteacher.com forward slash JV. Another great episode and one that really helps people get unstuck from some of these scary hurdles to getting started in real estate investing. We would love, love, love for you to leave us a five-star rating and review. It helps others find us. We'd also appreciate you sharing this podcast with your friends and family. As we've talked about, investing together can build some great community and make for some great friendships. Make sure you hit the subscribe button on all social media platforms. We are at Invested Teacher on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All links and resources and a full transcript here, folks, uh, can be found uh, over on our website, investedteacher.com forward slash episode nine. Again, that's investedteacher.com forward slash episode nine. Kyle? Hey, uh, friends, there's a giveaway going on and we haven't really been talking about it on the show a whole lot. So I'm going to say it right here at investedteacher.com forward slash giveaway. Basically, the ask is that you do that sharing, that subscribing. And there's a couple other action items where you get more ballots for the more sharing, the more love you're willing to give the podcast, the channels, things like that. So head over to investedteacher.com forward slash giveaway. We We've got all kinds of goodies, including some books and some gift cards and all kinds of wonderful stuff to help push you further along your journey. Well, invested students, class dismissed. This is not investment advice for entertainment purposes only. The content is for informational purposes. You should not construe any such information or material as otherwise as legal, tax, investment, financial, 
or other advice.